Is it sinful to consume alcohol? Can we drink in small amounts if we just don't get drunk? What about Jesus miraculously making alcoholic wine in Cana, or was it non-alcoholic? Tonight on GBN Live, we will be discussing the topic of social drinking. Join B.J. Clark and Troy Spradlin as they sit down with Mike Hickson and discuss this relevant topic. Live from the Gospel Broadcasting Network, located just outside of Memphis, Tennessee. Be a part of today's episode by calling in or interacting with us through Facebook. Now from Olive Branch, Mississippi, it's GBN Live. Good evening and welcome again to GBN Live. We're glad to be in your home tonight. We're going to be discussing social drinking. Hope you'll stay with us. We have with us this evening B.J. Clark. B.J., always good to be with you. Yes, sir. And Troy Spradlin. And Troy, great to have you on the program tonight. Happy to be here. Thank you. As we begin this subject, this is a volatile subject in many circles, and it's a needed subject in terms of biblical discussion. There are a lot of folks that want to make the case that it is biblically acceptable to drink alcohol. So how would you respond to that? I know that there are a number of, there are a number of arguments, but I guess maybe first question, is it sinful to, to consume alcohol recreationally? In Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1, the Bible affirms that wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. But it goes further than that in the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 20, he says, Be not among wine bibbers, don't even be among them. And then he goes on to explain that the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, verse 21. And then he says later in this very passage, he says uh, in verse number 26, My son, give me thine heart, let thine eyes observe my ways. He gives some warnings about strange or loose women. And then says in verse 29, Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, and who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, and someone says, ah, but see, it's only if you tarry long at the wine, but they haven't read far enough. Because the solution to make sure you never do that is verse 31, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright at the last, it'll bite you like a serpent, sting like an adder. So the solution, according to the Proverbs writer, is don't even be among the wine bibbers and don't even look at the intoxicating drink. How does that justify social drinking? And if you ask, is it sinful? Is it sinful to do the opposite of what the Bible says to do? And the answer to that would be absolutely yes. Yes, sir. Great stuff. I do want to invite you to please feel free to give us a call tonight. You may call us at 888-805-3390. Feel free to email us at gbnlive at gbntv.org. We would love to take your calls tonight as we discuss this subject. And this is, as I said a moment ago, an important subject, one that needs uh, biblical treatment. I appreciate what B.J. said based on Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1, and as, as well as Proverbs chapter 23. And you know, if you look at that series of woes, and I know many people equate drinking socially to fun times, happiness. Mm -hmm. And yet, when I read Proverbs chapter tw uh, 23, verse 29, that doesn't look like a lot of fun to me. <laughs> That's ac absolutely right. In fact, he goes on to say, your eyes will behold strange women, thine heart will utter perverse things. You'll be as he that lies down in the midst of the sea or the he that lies on the top of a mast. And they've stricken me. You'll say, I wasn't even sick. They've beaten me and I, I didn't feel it. When shall I awake? I'll seek it yet again. Mm. And this is obviously one of the problems is that uh, alcohol is one of those things that impairs our judgment. And uh, certainly it's not the kind of uh, conduct that ought to be associated with those who want to be Christians. Absolutely. Well, one of the questions earlier was, is, is it a sin? And I don't actually know of any book, chapter, or verse that says that drinking alcohol is a sin. But it's, it's beyond that. It goes beyond. Just because the Bible doesn't say that something, this is sinful, doesn't mean that we have permission to do it. Now, the Bible doesn't say that we shouldn't use or prohibit, for example, crack cocaine or anything, but that doesn't mean we should be taking that either or morphine or anything else. Sure, sure. And uh, certainly that's, that's right because 
I, I don't read in the Bible, thou shalt not drive 120 miles per hour through a school <laughs> zone. But I read in Romans 13 that I'm supposed to obey the laws. Of course, someone says, well, alcohol is legal. But there are certain things that are legal in the state, the United States, that God has deemed illegal to the Christian or to, the, to anyone for that matter. And we ought to obey God rather than men, Amen. Acts 5.29. Well, you know, they have uh, legalized marijuana hmm. in many states. Right. But that doesn't mean it's permissible, biblically right. speaking. And homosexuality, among other things, uh, legal, and yet God's Word trumps all of that. Didn't Peter and John say we ought to obey God rather than men? Yes. And so ultimately God's Word trumps uh, yes. anything and everything. Uh, one of the questions that we received tonight, why is drinking alcohol so offensive to us in the church, but we turn a blind eye to smoking tobacco? And then they make the statement, seems inconsistent. How would you respond to that? I, I personally do not believe that we have turned the blind eye to tobacco. I think that most of us who preach and teach have uh, sought to encourage people to stay away from it because it's harmful to the body. Absolutely. It, the thing about tobacco is it's just as destructive, but it's, there is a difference. I agree with you. We haven't turned a blind eye. We do preach about it, but there is a difference between alcohol and tobacco. Alcohol has things like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, Alcoholics Anonymous, it destroys lives. It uh, is, is a, it's registered as a disease. And so it's, it's a little bit different, but we, I don't think we've turned a blind eye at all. No, you know, nicotine is uh, a very addictive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very addictive. And uh, people become, well, quite frankly, they become enslaved. Uh, to smoking and and uh, dipping and chewing and as a matter of fact, I I had someone tell me who had a relative that uh, had uh, I think it was throat cancer and they'd been smoking and so they turned to dipping and they found out that dipping mm -hmm. was even more harmful than smoking right. and so tobacco is uh, it's deadly. Right, and to be consistent, we would oppose both, uh, not either or. For, you know, we don't have to say, well, one is this and the other is that. I, I think what Troy is saying, and I, I do understand that aspect of it, one reason we emphasize alcohol and prohibition of, of alcohol so much, I think, is because of the, there aren't that many accidents that happen on the highway because of people smoking, tobacco related. but there are a whole bunch of deaths that take place. A lot of people who commit crimes were not under the influence of tobacco when they did it, but they were under alcohol. Does that mean tobacco is okay? No, it doesn't right. because it affects the body in a different way, but it still affects the body and uh, certainly the Christian ought not want to do anything that would, uh, that would be harmful. Yeah, you know, I think about uh, what Paul said with regard to the body, the body being the temple of God. Amen. And I understand that we are the church, individually speaking, collectively we make up the universal church, but we don't want to do anything to, to destroy the body. As a matter of fact, Paul said we're to glorify God in our body, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, and in our spirit. And so uh, we would not want to do anything that would, that would detract from that. Absolutely. You're speaking to somebody who chewed tobacco for over 20 years. And it is very addictive and, and it was one of the most difficult things for me to stop. And that's why I can definitely say we're not neglecting the subject because I heard the sermons yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and, I, and I studied the Bible and I knew that that was something I needed to stop doing. And you know what both of you guys said with regard to uh, the number of highway accidents caused by alcohol. I was talking to someone the other day about uh, some of my classmates mm. that uh, I can think about one young man who was 15 years of age and he and another fellow were out uh, on the highway. Uh, they were uh, speeding uh, and they, uh, they hit a pole uh, off the interstate and literally wrapped that car around the pole and, and killed this classmate of mine instantly. He's 15 years old, never really had a chance to live. Mm. Uh, and I could duplicate that many times over of the number of individuals who have become casualties because of, of drinking and driving or because they've been, somebody's been uh, hit by a drunk driver. Right. Another question's come in. Does Deuteronomy 14 verse 26 teach that you can spend your money on strong, dr strong drink? Deuteronomy 14 26 reads as follows, thou shalt 
bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul desireth is the thought. It lusteth after is the King James Version rendering for oxen or for sheep or for wine or for strong drink or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God and thou shalt rejoice thou and thine household. And so here's a, a thing that we have to remember about uh, the Bible and what it teaches. The Bible teaches very clearly that there are certain things that were designed for certain purposes. For example, if you read in Proverbs chapter 31, there's a statement that is made there in Proverbs 31 and verse number 6. Uh, Proverbs 31, I believe it's verse yep. number 6, where it says, Give strong drink to those who are perishing. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. And so, what is the thought here? Look, I would never say that morphine is a drug that ought to be used recreationally because it is not indeed designed for that purpose. But if someone is in the throes of dying and they're in intense pain mm. and they need morphine on that occasion, then that's an occasion that is a justifiable use of that medicine for that purpose. And a strong drink was sometimes used as their form of pain killing for those who are dying in the midst of dying. And so there were, it's an assumption that cannot be justified to suggest that uh, the mention of strong drink, plus there was a sacrifice in which they were to take the strong drink and not put it down their gullet, but to pour it out it was a poor offering. And so it is assuming too much to suggest that because you see <clears throat> a statement here in Deuteronomy 14, 26, that the strong drink would be used for social purposes. Sure. Yeah, there were other purposes for which it could be used that would not require it to be consumed. And because that would contradict other passages, and the Bible doesn't contradict yeah. itself. That's right, great stuff. Great, great points. Uh, in Leviticus chapter 10, we read about Nadab and Abihu. And in verses 8 and 9, there's a statement made. The Bible says, Then the Lord spoke to Aaron saying, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest your diet shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. And I think about the priesthood here obviously uh, being told not to use any type of intoxicating drinks. And by way of correlation, I think about in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 2, we're identified as priest. We are a royal priesthood. Could you make the case that based on the fact that we are priests of God, that it would be just as wrong for us to use alcoholic beverages as it was for the priest under the Old Covenant. Absolutely. Uh, what comes to mind for me is uh, a verse that I was looking at earlier. It was, um, here we go, Third John uh, 11. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil is not seen God. Well, if you're a priest, and you are of God, then why would you want to participate in something that is so destructive? Now, we're supposed to imitate Jesus. And if we're imitating Jesus, then why would we want to participate in something that's as destructive as you know, alcohol? You know, I think, I think that's, a, that's a great point. If, if Jesus were on earth, would he drink socially? And mm -hmm. I know some people automatically rush to John chapter 2, the marriage feast in Cana of Galilee, and they say, there it is right there, Jesus turned water into wine. But if you would, maybe elaborate a little bit upon the context there, and, and because I know that some people use John chapter 2 to justify social drinking, which I, I don't think it's warranted, but nonetheless we need to look at the passage. Absolutely. Um, if I might say one quick word about Leviticus 10, uh, because I do believe that there is something in this text that gives us an indication that alcohol is dangerous for the very reasons that it impairs one's judgment. There is no evidence that Nadab and Abihu were deliberately using strange fire just to see if God really meant what He said, but there's no doubt that they used strange fire. And the fact that the warning was given in connection with avoiding death does seem to indicate that this, for example, there in Leviticus chapter 10, 
the statement is made in verse number 8, The Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink thou, nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. So this seems to be an indication that that somehow in some way alcohol was involved because what would be the out of the blue purpose for mentioning this right on the heels of his sons dying and then this legislation is given to indicate that uh, there has to be some connection. Now with reference to John chapter 2 as you said context, context, context. And there's a statement that is made in verse 10 that absolutely makes it impossible (laughs) that Jesus is turning this water into intoxicating wine. In John 2.10 the governor of the feast or the ruler of the feast has tasted the water that was made into wine in verse 9 and he called the bridegroom. He says, Now every man at the beginning does set forth good wine And when men have well drunk, or drunk freely, or largely in large amounts, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. Now think about this. Jesus Christ has just taken uh, these water pots with water, and if you add it all up, he would be uh, he would be turning an additional amount of close to uh, I think it's 160 gallons uh, (laughs) approximately of wine now. Even those who try to support social drinking will almost always say, but drunkenness is wrong, even though we, I'm sure, are going to talk about when drunkenness starts. But uh, the Bible teaches that Jesus, after these folks had drunk large amounts already, adds to it with intoxicating wine. How Mm. could you say that Mm. the Lord Jesus would condemn drunkenness and to people that had already drunk so much at this point, supply them with all these many gallons more. That does not matter. The word oinos in Greek doesn't always mean intoxicating wine. It means simply the juice of the grape. That's right. That's right. At and, times. and as you said, it would be inconsistent. It would have been inconsistent for the Lord to have done that. Right. And uh, He would have never sanctioned that kind of behavior. That word, well drunk, did some study on that and found some interesting things. Is a, a, a lot of versions of the Bible, translations, render that in different ways. Right. And so it's kind of confusing. But what it really means is to be, they drunk freely or to be satiated. And that same word that's there, I think it's methuo, methusko, is in Psalm 23, verse 5, if you go to the, using the uh, Septuagint, in that version, where it says that uh, when David's writing, it says, My cup runs over. That's that word, uh, methuo, there. And so it shows that they were just full. They were satisfied. They, they weren't intoxicated. The word can mean intoxicated, but doesn't always mean I think that. context plays a big part in what we're talking about Amen. tonight. Right. And we know the Lord never sinned, not once. Amen. Habakkuk 2 15 says, Woe to him that gives his neighbor strong drink. Wait a minute. If Jesus is supplying strong drink for these neighbors or friends who are at the wedding, then He has violated the law of Moses and thus sinned and thus cannot be a Savior. Who can believe that? There's no way that Jesus would have violated the law of Moses by giving intoxicating wine to His neighbors. That's not at all what He did. That's right. That's right. You know, you mentioned a moment ago uh, the point at which a person becomes drunk. And one of the questions that, that we were given tonight, can a person drink small amounts of alcohol with ever, without having ever become drunk? Would, would that be acceptable? And at what point does a person become intoxicated? H- how do you respond to that? I would say, well, where do you draw the line? You know, can I take just a little bit of morphine or, or something like that and, and not get high? I, you know, where, do, where do you draw the line? I, I think you're just trying to justify something that, that really don't need to justify. Because really, alcohol in any amount begins to dull the senses, and one of the first things that goes is self-control. That's exactly right. You noted earlier the importance of word studies. And there's a word in Ephesians 5 that is very key to this very question that you're asking. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, or that word literally could be translated riot, 
but be filled with the Spirit. Now, what this is in the original language is what we refer to as an inceptive verb, meaning it refers to beginning the process of something. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you look at some of the Greek word studies, they say things like to begin to be softened, to grow drunk. It's, you can grow drunker and drunker, but the Bible already noted at the beginning of the program says don't even look at the stuff. Right. If you never take the first drink, you'll never take the fatal drink or the alcoholic drink, the one that makes you an alcoholic. If you never take the first one, Paul says don't even, this is Methusco, inceptive verb, do not begin the process of intoxication. That right there shows you that uh, if you have started to do drink intoxicating beverages, you're beginning the process of intoxication, something the Bible expressly forbids. Yeah, you know, B.J., uh, I, I, I couldn't help but think about it. First Timothy chapter 3, one of the characteristics that uh, is, is to be demonstrated in the life of someone who would serve as an elder is there to be sober-minded. And that, that word literally carries with it the idea of being free from intoxicants. Mm. I believe that this idea of sobriety is inclusive of every member of the body of Christ. Not just elders, or de but rather every member of the body Amen. of Christ. That's right. Absolutely. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back in a couple of minutes. Hope you'll stay with us. We at the Tri-City School of Preaching and Christian Development are endeavoring to make gospel preachers. But you may ask, who is a gospel preacher? A gospel preacher is one who will preach the Word of God without fear or favor. He is a man that will preach the Word of God in season and out of season. He is a man of God who will allow his speech to be seasoned with salt and one that will always speak the truth in love. A gospel preacher is a man that speaks as the oracles of God and is a man who cares for the souls of men. Why not become a gospel preacher or study the Bible further that you may endeavor to grow your Christian development at the Tri-City School of Preaching Christian Development in Elizabethan, Tennessee. Come and be with us. Thank you for tuning in to GBN Live. If you have a question related to tonight's topic that you would like to have answered, please call 888-805-3390. That's 888-805-3390. You can also email us at gbnlive at gbntv.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us live each week. You can send your questions through Facebook in the comments section, and we will do our best to get them answered on the air. Now back to the program. Thank you for staying with us during our break. We are back to discuss social drinking tonight. We've had a great discussion thus far. We want to continue that discussion. I want to turn our attention to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 5 where Paul instructed Timothy to no longer drink water but use wine for his often infirmities. Some folks want to latch onto that verse and say that that warrants the usage of alcoholic beverages. How do you respond to that? Well, it's medicinal purposes, first of all. Uh, you know, we have medicines that have alcohol in them like NyQuil or Robitussin or things like that. And you mentioned morphine and, and other drugs that we use in order to deaden pain. And so, in this case, it's kind of interesting that they use this verse to wa warrant uh, social drinking because I don't know how many bars carry a Robitussin or, or have a ladies night with NyQuil or something like that. So uh, I don't understand why they go to this verse to try to justify that. Well, you know, sometimes people do strange things when they're trying to uh, justify a practice. Precisely. The fact that the Apostle Paul has Had to, to talk Timothy into thinking this is okay Right. as long as it's done for medicinal purposes, is a very telling argument in and of itself. Because if what some of our brethren and friends are telling us is true, if social drinking is A-OK -okay anyway, why would Paul have to persuade Timothy mm -hmm. to cross exactly that line right. and to take even a little? And he says, you know, use. It's being used for a specific purpose. This is not hanging out in a social setting saying, hey, would you like a, a drink? This is uh, using the properties of alcohol that are 
you know, designed to help with certain medicinal needs. And so, yeah, this, this passage, I cannot ever imagine why, well, I think it's desperation, to be honest with you, to say, well, see, here Paul is encouraging its use. Well, he's encouraging, encouraging its use in what way? That's right, medicinally. medically speaking. And he has to talk Timothy into it, which and you, shows. And you know, there is a strong contrast between that verse in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3, where the Apostle Peter talks about banqueting or drinking parties. Yes. And he talks about the excess, uh, the excessive lives that people are, are living in that day and time. Which, uh, if you look at that idea of drinking parties there, it, it would uh, fit well with our cocktail hours today in this day and time. Right, exactly. I love that passage. Uh, the main thing I love in 1 Peter 4 there is that, that no longer should we live the rest of our time in the flesh of lust of men, but for the will of God. And so we started out in this program talking about why would a Christian even want to try to justify drinking socially or any other way whenever we need to put those things aside. And I, I find it interesting, verse 4, he says, they, talking about the Gentiles, they think it's strange you do not run with them. You mentioned earlier, uh, 1 Peter 2, 9, where we are peculiar people. We're, we're to be separate and set apart. That's right. You know, B.J., you mentioned Ephesians 5 a minute ago. And in the book of Ephesians in chapter 4, there's a strong, uh, really a, a distinction made between the old man and the new man. And, and when a person becomes a Christian, as you said a moment ago, old habits, that old lifestyle is to be put to death. And that would include uh, drunkenness or, or the use, consumption of alcoholic beverages. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 6. There were people that were caught up in the muck and mire of, of immorality and ungodly living, but they, they ceased that practice once they became children of God. Yes. There's something else in 1 Peter 4 that is of interest because sometimes people will read verse 3 and say, Aha, it says, when we walked in lasciviousness, lust excess of wine. As long as you don't drink wine to excess, that's the problem. It's okay to drink wine in moderate amounts, just not excessively. This is what we're told, okay? But let's think about this, because the very next verse, verse 4, mentions that you not run with them to the same excess of riot. Mm -hmm. Does this imply that moderate rioting is okay? <laughs> no. Social rioting is okay just as long as it's not excessive? Well, we laugh at that because it's so obviously preposterous. Well, the same thing is true with reference to the wine that's used here. And the word revelings, as you said, the word banquetings, all these words are just building a case against being among the wine bibbers in the sense of doing that for social purposes and, only. And, yes. and you know, B.J., as, as, as you guys pointed out a moment ago, when you look at 1 Peter chapter 4, think about some of the characteristics that are associated, some of the types of behavior that are, ex, are associated with drinking alcoholic beverages. I mean, where, n number one, where do people usually go? To bars, clubs, etc. And then what are they doing in those bars and clubs? I mean, it, it, it just, as you said, it just feeds it, it really builds on one another. It really does. It, it usually it incites violence. Uh, it incites. Uh, you mentioned your friend that uh, was killed in the car wreck. Uh, just it it it's destructive. That's the thing about alcohol. Yeah, you know, two things about the devil that come to mind. Number one, he is the master of deceit. Hmm. Uh, John calls him the deceiver of the whole world. And then secondly, wherever the devil goes. He is always leaving a wake of destruction behind him. Mm -hmm. And you look at alcohol, look at, I mean, I mean, you could just build a case against alcohol with regard to, to the problems that it has created in, 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 in America alone. Uh, I, I will confess that I sometimes will watch cops, the episodes where they interact with people that they pull over and the houses they go to. Have you noticed how many times, how many times they go to pull someone over and the problem is they're, they're intoxicated or they have drugs of other varieties on them, on their person. Uh, they've been intoxicated and so they're in a fight with each other at the house, domestic dispute. And alcohol just seems to be the underlying factor in you, you so many You, you of mentioned these domestic things. problems. Look at the number of homes 
that have been destroyed and divided as a result of alcohol consumption. Look at the number of children that have been abused sexually and verbally and physically because of alcohol consumption. And we want to make a case that it's okay to use that stuff. I mean, look, man, that stuff is the devil's brew. Right. And, and uh, there have been too many people hurt by the consumption of alcohol for any Christian to ever sanction its usage in any capacity. That's right. There's some statistics that I uh, saw it said 70% of all murders involve alcohol, 41% of all assaults, 50% of rapes, 60% of sex crimes, and the list just goes on and on and on. And what about, what about the reputation of a Christian? You know, Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12 told Timothy uh, to conduct himself as a New Testament Christian. And he talked about his manner of life, his conduct. Don't you, don't you think that our consumption of alcohol or lack thereof would say something about our character? Amen. Well, it does because no one wants to be known as that guy that can't keep a job because of this or that. Look, my, my dad told me before I came over here tonight, he said, you have my permission if you think it's, you know, uh, you know, fitting at the time to bring up the fact that I'm now 50 plus years sober, my dad is. There were, before he became a Christian, he tried all that alcohol would hopefully, you know, hope to give anyone. If it could have given him happiness, he would have found it because that's what his life was at one point in time in his life. And of course, he didn't take his first drink ever intending to get to the point where he would be trying to see what alcoholic content he could get out of cough syrup or rubbing alcohol bottles. Um, but you know, he just got that desperate and then a a teenage boy showed him some interest and uh, said to him, you know, I believe if I were you, I'd start reading my Bible. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad he said that because my dad was suicidal. He was that the alcohol had done nothing but make him miserable, miserable, a miserable mess. He was a gambler, a fighter, a brawler. No one wanted to be around him. They wanted to move out on him. And yet here's a teenage baby faced boy that had the courage to say, the Bible has the answers you need. If he hadn't said that, I don't know where my dad would have ended up, where I would have ended up. I know alcohol didn't give me the good life that I have now. Jesus Christ did. And, and don't you think that there are people watching the program tonight, some may be struggling with alcohol, some may have family members, friends that are, that are struggling with the use of alcohol. And, and I, I think that we could safely say that, you know what, if you'll follow God's Word, if you'll let God's Word rule your life, I promise you, God will bless you. You know, when Moses in the book of Deuteronomy set before the children of Israel blessings and cursings and basically said, look, if you'll follow God's Word, He'll bless you. If you don't, He'll curse you. And there are a lot of folks today whose lives are just so sad and so out of control. And yet if they could only look to Scripture and say, you know what, I'm going to follow this book, they would be amazed at, at the transformation that it would make. Look at your dad, a, a living example of that. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. I, well, I can relate to your dad. I fell away from the church. I grew up in the church, fell away, and lived a pretty worldly life, and alcohol was my drug of choice. And so whenever people talk about social drinking and things like that, it, it, it really doesn't catch a lot of traction with me because the biggest thing that I found, and when you're talking about the Bible changing your life, that, that's absolutely true. It changed my life. And the first thing that I had to deal with was my own influence. That's right. uh, what, what am I going to do uh, if I cause somebody to stumble? And I tried all kinds of ways using verses like this to try to justify it. And I thought, well, okay, so let's say I have a drink in my home, home in privacy in my home, but I have to get that somewhere. So if I stop at a liquor store and Sister Johnson drives by and sees me, sees my car there, or what about if I walk up to the counter with that six pack of beer and the young lady who's going to check me out says, uh, you know, I've been thinking about going to church or been asking, want to ask you a question about Jesus and here I have, or even if she doesn't know me, she, she comes to the church where I go and says, that's that man who bought... Uh, what does that say about your influence? Exactly, exactly. Absolutely. And you know, we were talking earlier about health benefits and the allegation is that, uh, you know, Drinking alcohol, even in moderate amounts, helps your heart. And yet, if you do a study and notice that 
the folks at the uh, American Heart Association and other places who are medically qualified point blank will tell you do not drink, start drinking alcohol in an attempt to improve your heart because there are too many dangers of addiction associated with it that you might not ever be able to recover from. And this uh, resveratrol that is a part of the alcohol's ability to provide antioxidants uh -huh. to is also found, it's been studied and proven, you can get every bit as much of that benefit from grape juice, red and purple grape juice. Yeah, and you know, I would say to anyone who says that they're worried about uh, their, uh, the health of their cardio system, I'd say, let me tell you what, the best way to do it, walk, <laughs> run, get on a treadmill. There are, uh, there, there, are there are a lot of other ways yeah. to build your heart. You don't need to go to some foreign substance to, to build your heart. Right. Uh, yes, sir. I thought you could really say something. No, I was just agreeing with you. Um, I will, you know, we're talking about, this, this. speaking of the heart, this is a heart issue. It is a heart issue. Uh, and, and didn't Solomon say, guard your heart with all diligence? Amen. And, and I think that it is a heart issue. And, and I think at, uh, at the heart of the issue is, is the heart. And, and what we need to do is quit trying to make excuses, justifying the usage of, of alcohol. See it for what it is. It's the devil's brew. But one of the problems that I see a lot of times in Bible study is we want to look at the Bible with our 2019 glasses, and we just can't do that. You're going back to context. There's also historical context. And so whenever you think about what the Bible's talking about wine, I think you mentioned it a minute ago that the word oinos mm -hmm. does not always mean right. fermented wine. Right. It's, it's, in fact, there is all kinds of documentation uh, for ancient documentation, people like Pliny, uh, Homer, Athenaeus, that, that indicate and show that wine is not always that intoxicating drink. That it, It's watered down, it's filtered, it's just a, a drink that's used, and, and wine is, in the Bible, it can be just juice. That's exactly right. Uh, and that would, that would hold true for uh, the terms that are used in the Old Testament as well. Mm -hmm. uh, again, you've got to look at context. And uh, those words are sometimes generically used. Uh, I want to take a couple of questions very quickly. What about the recreational use of marijuana? We have talked about marijuana, but how, how would you respond to somebody who says, you know what, I don't see any, anything wrong with, with uh, smoking a little bit of pot? I think it goes back to that question we were asking earlier about how much can you use, well, where do you draw the line? Uh, as well as you're using a medicinal purpose to justify a recreational purpose. And, and again, why would we want to do something that uh, doesn't imitate Christianity? And look, the, some of the states that have more recently authorized the use of marijuana are already reeling from the results. And the idea that this is somehow a harmless drug, people have not done their homework if they say that's that right, it is right. a gateway drug. I know there are people who will deny it, and the people who will deny it are generally the very people who are profiting the most from denying it. It is a gateway drug, sure and is. it has caused problems of all kinds of you know problems when it comes to the workplace, lack of uh, you know ambition, just all kinds of issues connected to it. And so, no, it's it is not by any way, shape, or form a harmless recreational drug. And, and, and don't you think that we need to just say up front that the bottom line: Why do people drink? Why do they smoke pot? The reason is because they want to be high. They want to get a high. Yes. I mean, they're looking for that that sensation that that comes. And you can't tell me that alcohol tastes good. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I mean, anyone that's ever taken strong cough syrup. Uh, <laughs> Stuff almost knocks your head. NyQuil is horrible. And, and, and there are people that enjoy that taste. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and even if they did, uh, I mean, I won't eat spinach, uh, <laughs> but I think it does have some health benefits. But even if someone enjoyed it, uh, they might enjoy crack cocaine too, but that doesn't mean that doesn't that makes it. Right. That doesn't mean that personal enjoyment is divine authority <laughs> to partake. That's right. Yes. Well, you know, another thing in this too is, do you really? I believe that Jesus is coming back one day, and He may come back in our lifetime. Do I really want to 
be in my house or somewhere with a drink in my hand or marijuana in my system whenever the no. Lord comes back. No, and I don't want to be sitting in a bar either. That's right. right. Uh, or, or at a ball game. As a matter of fact, you, you know, I noticed just recently uh, some of the teams in the SEC, college teams in the SEC are now selling alcoholic beverages at their football games. And I thought, you know, that is a sad commentary, and I know what's driving. You know, I know what's driving uh, the whole deal. It's 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 about uh, economics. They're looking for you know the financial bottom line, but I think it's very unwise, and I think that they're going to reap a lot of repercussions as a result of that. Uh, the statistics show that college students spend multiplied billions of dollars, billions, every year on alcohol. And for what? It does not make their lives better. In fact, it is, if we were then to calculate the damage caused, uh, it's beyond any price tag that you mm. could put on it. Mm. I agree. I agree. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Please stay with us. In the early 1990s, a dedicated group of gospel preachers approached the eldership at the Hillview Terrace Church of Christ in Moundsville about overseeing a school of preaching. The eldership eventually took on the work, and in 1994, the school began. Research is aided by a library of nearly 10,000 volumes. The school has an intensive two-year curriculum that includes an examination of every book of the Bible, plus Bible-related subjects. Students will have courses in Christian evidences, church history, and restoration movement history. They will learn to answer the doctrines of denominations and world religions. Courses in grammar, homiletics, personal evangelism, and communication through media are aimed at making the graduates effective in relaying the gospel message. Four quarters of Greek ground students in the basics of the New Testament's original language. Participants in the program spend a lot of time on campus. Chapel is at 8.30 every morning, then the daily class schedule is from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. with a lunch break. Besides the library and classrooms, there is space available for printing papers and other work and a little relaxation. The premises feature a break room in which students can store food and prepare refreshments. Graduation ceremonies and dinners associated with the school's annual victory lectures are held on premises in the adjoining special events room. Generous donors and hardworking volunteers have made such nice facilities possible for students. The West Virginia School of Preaching continues to function on a donation basis. Students are not charged tuition, but are expected to raise their own living expenses through their home congregations. Single students may live in the school's dormitory, which houses up to seven men. There, they live rent-free and are only charged for their share of utilities. The school is under the oversight of the elders of the Hillview Terrace Church of Christ, whose facilities are across the parking lot. The aim of the West Virginia School of Preaching is to produce men who, upon graduation, are ready to preach. Most of our faculty are area preachers who offer their time and experience willingly. Utilizing seasoned preachers enables students to have a more practical view of preaching even beyond the valuable textbook knowledge they receive. Should a student want further education, this is facilitated by some Christian universities who offer our school's graduates several hours toward a bachelor's degree. Students' wives are offered classes on how to become better preachers' wives. These are scheduled flexibly so that the wives can be able to attend. West Virginia School of Preaching is located in Moundsville in the beautiful Upper Ohio Valley in the northern panhandle of West Virginia, about 12 miles south of Wheeling, West Virginia, and about an hour and a half southwest of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Moundsville has a rich mixture of history, culture, commerce, and industry. Restoration movement history abounds in this area. About a 45 minute drive away is Bethany, which was the home of Alexander Campbell. Living in Moundsville is cost effective with conveniences and amenities all nearby. Do you want to learn more about us? Examine our website at wvsop.com or look for our Facebook page. Feel free to call us at 304-845-8001. Give us a call, write us, or come visit us. We would love to hear from you. The Gospel Broadcasting Network is proud to bring you GBN Live. 
To have your questions answered on the program, please call us at 888-805-3390. That's 888-805-3390. Please try to keep your questions relevant to tonight's topic. If you have a different topic that you would like to have discussed on GBN Live, please email your request to gbnlive at gbntv.org, and we will do our best to accommodate your request. We're glad to be back. We are going to conclude our study of social drinking in a moment or two. I do understand that we've not touched the hem of the garment with regard to the number of arguments that are employed, but I think that we've done our best to try to give a biblical defense of why we as Christians do not use alcoholic beverages uh, recreationally. One of the questions that we've received tonight via Facebook, what about using alcohol in cooking? I know that there are a number of ladies that probably use some type of alcohol in cooking. I, for one, am not a cook. Uh, I can barely microwave, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I really can't speak to that. But uh, what about the use of alcohol in cooking? Uh, how how uh, prevalent is it? Well, it's very prevalent. In fact, my wife, uh, is a great cook and I think it would be more for flavor because you know one of the things we were talking earlier about the not having alcoholic content one of the ways is boiling off yeah. and so I would think that cooking alcohol would boil off any of those okay those ingredient those affect intoxicating yeah uh, and nobody's gonna get properties. drunk eating beer cheese or something like that so whatever that is that they would make I'm uh, Certainly no chef, but uh, my understanding is is that cooking does uh, the process of cooking removes the uh, the alcoholic properties of and the effect the impact okay. of of this of the substance. Okay. Uh, another question: How would you argue against one who would use gluttony as a defense for drinking alcohol? I'd say two wrongs don't make a right, but uh, how, how do you how do you answer that? The Bible's clear in pro prohibiting all things that would be harmful to us, and uh, it's definitely something that all of us have to uh, consider and, and take seriously. And uh, but there's uh, again, if you think about it, uh, th there aren't people killing as many people every year because they ate a cheeseburger. Uh, as there are, you know, those who are crossing the center line in a drunken stupor and sending families into eternity. And uh, I don't know too many broken homes that have broken up over, you know, uh, a few things like that that are more. Uh, now, one has to still be cautious and careful about the way that they uh, treat their body, but at the same time, uh, if I had a passage that says, don't even be at the restaurant where the cheesecake is, you know, then, <laughs> then I wouldn't be at the restaurant where the cheesecake is. And so, you know, those are the kinds of things we have to keep in mind. Yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're really not talking about apples to apples when you're talking right. about gluttony. Because as you said a moment ago, and I, I think well said, uh, e eating a hamburger or a piece of cheesecake doesn't typically cause or create accidents, et cetera. But the effects of alcohol, I mean, I mean, the data's in. You just read a moment ago, statistically, uh, the consequences that, that follow alcohol. And, and I don't think it takes an Einstein to realize alcohol has done a great deal of harm, not just in this country, but worldwide. That's right. Food is constructive to the body. I mean, we need food to build the body. Alcohol is destructive. That's right. That's right. Another question. Can you address the following passage in its proper context? For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he hath a devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous, and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. And that reference is Matthew 11, verses 18 and 19. Well, these are false accusations that he's addressing. He's not, John, they said that he had a demon. Well, did John have a demon? He did not have a demon. And so just because, again, I find it interesting that people who want to justify social drinking go to passages like this because he's, what he's saying is that you're calling me these things and it's not true. Good point. Another question, how does the concept of self-control fit into this discussion of social drinking? Hmm. And of course, temperance or self-control is mandated in Scripture. 
And uh, that could apply to a lot of different areas of life, but obviously in the realm of alcohol consumption, it would be very important, wouldn't it? For sure. Um, think about the sobriety that we mentioned earlier of 50 plus years or those that had to happen with self-control one day at a time over a period of, and every day there has to be that absolute decision. I will control myself when it comes to this particular substance and it's not going to do to me what it did to me in the past. I'm determined self-control is definitely a part of it. And, and you know, the devil knows that, that if he can hook you uh, uh, with regard to whether it be some type of chemical substance or alcohol, whatever, then he's got you. And, and yeah, you know, I had somebody tell me one time, they never had a problem with something they never tried. Hmm. And I think we could say to young people today, you know what, if you never, if you never try alcohol, you'll never have a problem. That's exactly that's right. Right. Ever. That's right. The fruit of the Spirit, that's one of the, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. And so it, that drinking alcohol or uh, one of the first things that goes when you drink alcohol is self-control and that winds up causing the violence. Yeah, don't people drink to lose their inhibitions many yes. times? And, and yet, right. look at the beer commercials. Know when to say when. Hmm. Huh. By drinking the stuff that will impair your ability to know when to say when. It's a contradiction that screams off the television sure set does. at us every day. Drink responsibly. You'll see it everywhere. Well, okay, but the problem is the substance I'm drinking is designed to make me irresponsible. Exactly. And so it's a complete, uh, you know, basically it's trying to make themselves look like, oh, we're, we're concerned. We're being, yes, yeah, but yeah. in reality, uh, they're saying drink the very thing that will make it harder for you to do what we're telling you to do. I mean, they're, they're, they're interested in the bottom line. And, and so as you said, you know, uh, they, they give the appearance, lip service, that they're concerned about the consumption of alcohol, but how do you drink responsibly? Hmm. Uh, you, you, you know, you, you think about all the, the mothers and fathers that have buried children, and, and the children that are buried, uh, parents because of alcohol usage or because of a drunken driver. And, and I wonder, you know, I, I've often thought, you don't ever see any ads on television depicting that, do you? You know, I remember years ago, Bob Euchre, in, in a television commercial uh, for one of the beers, he would stand at the uh, front of a tavern looking in the picture window and he'd say, boy, they're having fun in there. Well, you know, that's what the devil wants people to believe. That this, that, man, you deserve this. But, but again, the carnage is incredible. Another question, my company serves alcohol at our annual Christmas party. Am I sinning by attending this quote unquote mandatory event? I have a saying that I like to preach a lot of times. It's okay for the boat to be in the water, just don't let the water get in the boat. And so I think the same thing would go along with, uh, I was in construction at one time and I had to go to meetings that were mandatory and there were people cursing in those meetings. Is that, is that, is it sinful for me to be around those people who are cursing? And so, uh, again, we have to be in the world, but we're not of the world. Yeah, you know, and I, and I think that, that people who are in the world, they know you as a person. And, and, and I've been in situations where, based on uh, work uh, years ago, having to attend certain functions and alcohol was, was served. And yet the people that were there knew I didn't drink. Uh, they knew I didn't approve of that lifestyle. And I was there for one reason, because I had to be there. And uh, I had a buddy of mine who was, uh, who was my boss and he was a member of the church and he didn't, he, he didn't like it any more than I did. And, uh, uh, but we let it be known, look, we don't approve of this stuff. You know, you know most of the people act foolish when they, when they get in. And you probably had an influence over those people. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it's amazing the number of times, I had a boss one time that uh, he used profanity. And, and it was amazing the number of times he would go on a tirade and then he'd look at me and say, oh, I apologize, <laughs> you know? And I mean, he did have respect for, for my convictions. Now he may not have lived like that, but he respected me enough to, and, and so, yeah, you know, I just, you know, we, we don't want to be influenced by that. Uh, BJ? I've heard some folks say, you know, you can't go to a restaurant where they might serve alcohol. Now, I do, when I walk into a restaurant, say, look, I don't want to be seated near the bar. If they try to start seating me anywhere near it, I just don't want that. Yeah. I want to go over and, and get it somewhere else. 
But to be consistent, if people are going to be consistent, I wouldn't ask anyone to violate their conscience. No. But if to be consistent, uh, the grocery store sells beer and wine. I don't go down that aisle. I don't have any desire to go down that aisle. There's nothing for me there that I want. But does that mean I can't shop in the grocery store because the fella in front of me is buying a basket load of, of liquor? No, because that's not my choice. You know, for him, I've got to be able to, to buy those goods and services that I need, and I can't just completely uh, leave the world. I, I do have to be cautious and careful about where I go, and uh, I certainly wouldn't, you know, you know, cozy up at the bar right. with folks at a at a party. Uh, I'd find a group of people and, that were not imbibing. And, and you know, BJ, you just triggered a thought in my mind, and that is, uh, at the grocery. Uh, or convenience store. It's amazing to me the amount of money that people spend on alcohol, tobacco, et cetera. Right. And, and I, I couldn't help but think just a minute ago about how many families struggle from week to week to, to, to just eat by an existence. And you got a mom and a daddy that are using alcohol and, and, and it's taking away from the children taking away from, from things that they need in life. And so, you know, in terms of stewardship, it's, it's poor stewardship. Amen. Uh, very quickly, our time's almost gone. First Timothy chapter 3. Paul talks about one of the qualifications for an elder. He's not to be given to wine. For a deacon, he's not to be given to much wine. I know that, I know that this has caused a lot of confusion among some people. H how do you answer that, biblically speaking? Looking at the passage itself, uh, Paul is spotlighting what uh, qualifications an elder should have. And so he's essentially saying that a man who has anything to do with alcohol shouldn't have any business being an elder. A man who has uh, anything to do with alcohol shouldn't have any business being a deacon. But not only that, but it's interesting that the, the wives of them, <laughs> right. that's, that's the interesting thing. The, it doesn't say anything about uh, the wives and the deacons, but then it tells that the, uh, the wives of the elders you know, so, so you have basically, it's okay for women to drink, older women to drink, but not elders. It's okay for uh, the deacons to drink, but not their wives. That doesn't uh, make any this, sense. This argument proves too much if people are going to be consistent with it. Because look at the, the preposterous position this puts them in. If not given the much wine means it's okay to have a little, then the elders cannot drink at all, but the deacons can. But the deacons' wives and the elders' wives, according to verse 11, the word sober there means complete abstention exactly from alcohol. Right. So the deacon can drink, but his wife cannot. <laughs> the elder can't drink. But in Titus 2, 3, the older women are told not to be given to much wine. But in the very next verse, the young women are told to be sober, completely free from all wine. And so you would have this <laughs> situation where the elders can't drink at all, but the deacons can. But the deacons' wives can't. But the older women can. But the younger women cannot. <laughs> and we're supposed to believe that all of those came from the inspired pen. Look, James 1 says to avoid the superfluity of naughtiness or overflowing of wickedness. Amen. Does that mean in any way, shape, or form that as long as it's a moderate flow of wickedness, mm. that's okay? The Bible sometimes will speak to the excess of something to say, to say, don't do it at all. Great point, great point. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Great job tonight. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate those great answers. And thank you for being a part of our program. So glad to be in your homes tonight. Hope to see you back here again next Thursday night. Until then, God bless. This has been GBN Live. Thank you for watching.